for rolling. Okay, uh, we're interviewing Mr. Melvin G. Ledoux at uh, Culver Road Armory in Rochester, New York. It is November 20. 20th, 2001. Michael Akey, interviewer, Wayne Clark, uh, videographer. Uh, Mr. Ledoux, where were you born? Parma, New York. Parma, New York, okay. At uh, okay. Hilton, town of Parma. Okay, and um, did you go to school there? I went to school to the, to the eighth grade. Okay, and when did you graduate? Eighth grade. Eighth, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. That was in when? Oh my God. Uh, 32. Okay. Let me see, 33, maybe, 30, I went to work at, in 1932, late, last part of 32. All right, so right. this was during the Depression. That's right, I was 14 or something like where'd that. You go to, where'd you go to work? In a sawmill, and thrashing machines, and uh, everything. Carpenter work, and mm -hmm. blacksmith work, and... Pretty dangerous work. Well, I, uh, the one I worked for, he done everything. Uh -huh. And it was just like going to college. Only I learned about seven trades mm -hmm. <laughs> instead, oh, of, instead of uh, uh, college. Uh -huh. and I worked there until I was about uh, a little after 18, mm -hmm. 18 and a half. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I went uh, and bought a truck and went in a truck and hauling crops. How'd that go? I did that for a few years until I was married in 38, December of 38, and then I went back in the blacksmith shop working. What kind of work were you doing as a blacksmith? Uh, building, at that time we were still doing some wagon work mm -hmm. and a lot of truck body work and, and uh, snow plows and uh, all kinds of work, some horses. Okay. But I learned the blacksmith trade. I learned the carpenter trade, learned uh, several different, but blacksmithing was, uh, before World War II, mm -hmm. I could make a living at it. Really? But after the war, why, then I set up a little shop and my wife and I did some iron work, mm -hmm. quite a bit for General Electric. They was building a new plant and we made all the hangers and things for them. And, mm -hmm. And then it, that kind of petered out, and then I went into the general contracting. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I can. I was in Walker, New York. I had played for a dance on Saturday night. I played violin for parties. Oh. I came home, and Sunday morning I went to get my paper, and Pete Foose says to me, Bomb, Pearl Harbor's been bombed. And I said, you know, he hit me with it. Pearl Harbor got bombed. I said, so? <laughs> you know? He said, so it'll make a hell of a lot of difference to you before you get through. And it did. It did. Mm. And I have another thing that was interesting at that about that same time. I stopped on Ridge Road up by Murray. And uh, I... I my wife and I, I wasn't always working, so we bought scrap iron and sold it. And I stopped to this old uh, Ed Hates, and I says, Ed, you want to sell all that scrap iron out in back of the barn there? No, sir, by God, I don't. I'm not going to have those Japanese blowing it back at us. Hmm. And that was two years before <laughs> oh, so the war was, was even started. I, I'll always started. remember that. That's interesting. Yeah, a lot that of old scrap. man <laughs> had it pegged right, you know. A lot of scrap was going to Japan. It was the... going boatloads. See, we supplied them with scrap iron to shoot back. Yeah. Hmm. Now, um, once the war had started, uh, you, did you realize you're going to have to go in? Well, uh, I figured I'd have to. Uh, and then I felt uh, I had two kid, two boys, and uh, I figured every time you're walking around, you just felt like you should be there. So I got uh, a notice to uh, 
come in for a physical. Mm -hmm. So when I took the physical, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Why did you pick the Marines? Oh, I just said wanted to be in the Marines. I wanted to go. If I was going to be in, I wanted to go where the, I guess, where the action was. I could have went in the mechanics mm -hmm. in the airport force, or I could have went in to two or three places where I could be a mechanic, but I, I, I joined the Marine Corps. What did your wife think? Well, she didn't know I enlisted until after the war. She thought you were drafted? Yeah. Oh. But she, I thought she knew, but she was so surprised. But she stayed home and took care of the kids. And that's why I think she deserves the Purple Hearts and the plaques on the cemetery stones and all that stuff more than I do. Mm -hmm. Because she spent all that time for two boys and her for, with $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And we had just bought a house, a $25 a month payment. But she managed to keep it going and the taxes was paid and everything when I come home. That's great. Where did you go to uh, basic? Paris Island. What was that like? Well, I think everybody everybody knows what boot camp was. It was a, They were tough, but uh, really uh, much tougher than they are now, I guess. Really? Yeah, that was before that McKeenan drowned down there, mm -hmm. uh, Sergeant. When he got in all that trouble, we worked on that swamp too. Mm -hmm. And, oh, they were, uh, anybody that you've interviewed would tell you. Well, we like your... Uh, my opinion? Yes, sir. Well, I thought they were a little nastier than they had to be, especially on the... Now, with me, it didn't bother me because I was physically in good shape and right. had been working and... But uh, in some cases, I, I remember one boy came out of a shoe store and had never lifted more than a box of shoes. And he couldn't do push-ups. And uh, they, uh, he made one push-up, and of course he couldn't push him. So they come and put their foot on his head, and then he threw up, and they put his, pushed his head down into it. And, uh, Thought that was a little excessive? I think so, don't you? No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. See, to me, I look over and I could do 40 or whatever they right. wanted, see, and nothing to it. But uh, if, if a guy had never done anything, mm -hmm. and but when he came out of there, he was a uh, lean and mean. <laughs> do you think the, uh, the training helped you? Oh, well, yes. What they do, they tear you down and get you so you feel pretty worthless mm -hmm. and then they build you up to what they want with you. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you get out of boot camp, where do you go? I went to uh, uh, boot camp. I went up to Camp Lejeune, was there for a very short time. And then I came home and I just nicely got home and got a telegram. I had to go back. Mm -hmm. and then we went to Camp Pendleton. And from Camp Pendleton to San Diego, or was right by San Diego, and then we shipped out of San Diego and went to Guadalcanal. Now, you were trained as a what? Rifleman. A rifleman, okay. B.A.R. man. Oh, barman. Okay. Um, so you're going overseas. You're, um, was it a good squad you were in? Oh, yeah. We got over there, and... Uh, it was the Raiders was on Guadalcanal, but then they uh, formed the 6th Division, Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And the 6th was the uh, 29th, the 22nd, and the 4th Regiments. Okay. And it, this is interesting, I think, for your... The 6th Division is the only division of Marines that never was on the home United States. Really? It was formed in the Pacific and was closed out in the Pacific. Now, what regiment were you in? I was in the 4th Regiment, 6th okay. Division. Okay. Uh, your, uh, your uh, squad sergeant, the uh, old timer? Uh, the s squad sergeant. Well, I have a picture of uh, of the squad leader. 
He got the Medal of Honor. Really? It's in my book here. Oh. Bush was his name. Uh-huh. And uh, the my when I went when we went into Okinawa, uh Jack Willard was a China Marine, our lieutenant. Uh -huh. He was an old timer. Uh -huh. And uh he got killed, of course. Was Okinawa your first? Uh... Well, no, it was a f uh, uh, first invasion for the Sixth Division. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, uh, a lot of the same guys that was on Gu Guadalcanal went into the Sixth Division. Okay. And then went uh, Okinawa. And uh, I don't know what you want to know about that. I oh, mean, that, let's see. Um, so uh, Okinawa was your first combat experience? Uh, well, the first combat, yeah. Okay. What was it like for you? Didn't seem to bother me too much. Really? I mean, we uh, we had been on uh, in, uh, landings in the, down at Bougainville and like that. What was Bougainville like? Well, it's a wild, uh, terrible jungle. Mm -hmm. Guadalcanal is a terrible jungle. Mm -hmm. uh, land crabs, mosquitoes, mm -hmm. swamp, snakes. Now, what was uh, the job of the BAR man? Well, each in the Marine Corps, you have three squads of 13 in a platoon. Mm -hmm. Each squad has a squad leader, and it has uh, three four-man fire teams. Each fire team has a BAR man and two riflemen and an assistant bar man. Carries a small rifle and carries the ammunition for the browning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that put three BARs in each squad. That's pretty good firepower. That was very good power, firepower. Each a BAR shoots 20 rounds and you carried 12 magazines here and six across here. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of firepower. Did you like the weapon? I liked it. I didn't mind it, but uh, it was heavy, uh -huh. and that's why some guys didn't carry it. But I, I mean, I didn't give me no trouble carrying it. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't even feel pretty secure with it. I liked it better than a bayonet. Uh -huh. Usually, you shot uh, with a bipod, or uh, we threw the bipod away almost immediately. Why is that? Because there, there's no place. To, that was, uh, oh, uh, somebody up above says use a bipod, but you're in stones, you're in, you, most of the time you can't set it down. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you're using it like this. So you're firing from hip? From the hip okay. most of the time. They, the way they make it sound like you were in the movies, and you go here and you'd have a nice flat spot to set it down and you get right. down. And you never had that much time. I mean, it never was that kind of a place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but I have something to tell you about. Uh, April the first, nineteen forty-five, is when they hit Okinawa. Okay. And we was aboard ship, in, getting ready to disembark to go into the landing craft, and all of a sudden, I know I was facing the platoon, and all of a sudden I looked up, and here come one of our airplanes in wagging his wings like this mm -hmm. and he was coming in like this and our ship that I was on shot him down. One of our planes. And they hollered but the gunner he just got orders to fire and that ship came over and we could see the pilot almost see his eyes you know and hit the water and it was a flash of flame and I've talked with several guys not that wasn't in my outfit mm -hmm. later on that seen that and they couldn't get over it how I, hmm. one of our own ships planes got pilot didn't make it oh no okay. there's nothing left one well when you, you landed on okinawa that that was a fairly easy landing wasn't it wasn't it was easy went right over the top of the japanese mm -hmm. they were dug in went right over them I was in the first wave, and then after we got past them, then they came up from behind and in front too. But it wasn't a tough landing. We went to the airport. We uh, 
Yontan, Yontan Airport, I believe it was. I don't know if you have a record of that, and I, I got it in my book. Uh, and when we got there, I remember we were all, all the way around. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the Japanese plane landed, come in, taxied up, pilot got out. He didn't know that the Marines had taken the <laughs> air. He got out, and I think everybody that was there shot him. Oh dear. I'm telling you, they shot from all directions because everybody was keyed up. Right. I suppose they all wanted to kill the Japanese. It's a bad career move. Yeah, I know, um, but that, it didn't seem like that was necessary either, but that's what happened. Now, the first wave, you, you came in on what? What were you, what? Uh, uh, landing craft with a ramp in the back. Right in the back? Yeah. Okay. They drove up and landed, and fortunately uh, for us, we landed in the water that we could come in on. Okay. But uh, the sh boat next of us, the landing craft next of us, got hit and it blew up in the air and dumped all the guys in the China Sea. Now, um, you, so you've, you land in uh, Okinawa. And, and then, uh, uh, off and on, we went across. But you see now, when you're, when you're in combat, you're not in, on the front line all the time. Okay. I don't know if you guys must know more about this than I do. But uh, 4th Regiment, 22nd and the 29th, formed the 6th, so there might be, the 4th Regiment might be up and have, uh, each one has got four groups, mm -hmm. so they'd have uh, a group online and three in reserve. Okay. And then when this w would work a while, and then all of a sudden another one would move through. Okay. So uh, everybody thinks you're right on the front line every minute, but you're off and on. So when you're back in reserve, uh what did you generally do? Well, then you're just waiting. Hurry up and wait. <laughs> and you get shelled anyway. I mean, uh, uh, you're, in, you're, ac you're in combat, but you're not right up, right up on the front line. At night, they form a line, and they always, it don't matter what I'm trying to say is wherever there's anybody, there's more behind them, right behind them uh -huh. to, to back them up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the things that was of interest always to me is uh, whenever the main body wasn't in combat, you had outposts. Okay. 500 yards out, three quarters of a mile out, you'd have four Marines here and four over here mm -hmm. around, and they'd have wires, telephone. They didn't have intercoms. Mm -hmm. Then they had telephone wires. And you'd be out there to alert the main body if any had any uh, Japs come in, see. Because uh -huh. I remember one time I was on outpost and all of a sudden we looked up and here come a group of people, uh, Okinawans and Japanese, and we thought they were civilians and, and uh, the first one, he didn't have anything on but uh, like shorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he walked up. I know I was standing and had Marines on both sides with the BARs, two BARs, pointing across like this. Mm -hmm. And he came up to me and he, he, he said, Okana, Okana, and he bent over like that. And all of a sudden he straightened up and he had a hairy carry knife with a string around his neck and had this little stick of wood about this long. Mm -hmm. And he pulled the handle off, and he went like this. And boy, he got me right under my cartridge belt. And if I hadn't had a cartridge belt on, he'd have swept me wide open. Goodness. And these guys shot the whole, huh. whole, whole bunch of them. You know, now I, I, I don't know if you want that on record or That's not. Fine. But. That's fine. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not very nice. You, you basically th thought they were civilians. Well, I thought they were civilians. We was we was telling them the Susume to go back and and uh, 
that, that they would be picked up and put into a commune, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Ab the first one turned out to be was a soldier was uh, soldiers that was trying to get through. Okay. Oh, that's one instance. Does that kind of thing happen often? Ah, uh, yes. And we had one little old lady come through and they were letting her through and she was like this and she had her oh, I don't know what you call it, a schmuck or blouse mm -hmm. and it was full of hand grenades and she got in where the Marines was and she started throwing hand grenades. Mm -hmm. Little old woman. So after a while you were very wary. Well, of they used to say uh, don't pay no attention who it is. I mean, and then our lieutenant always says don't forget every one of these kids you kill is one that your kids won't have to fight. That was the Marines <laughs> attitude. I, uh, when I think about it now, it, it, it sounds different to me than it did at the time. Sure. You know, the, um, your basic equipment, was it pretty good? Yes. I and mean, we worked with tanks and uh, everything. Uh, we, we was all right. We, uh, of course, the only equipment we had was our rifle and, uh -huh. but we, they had uh, each, uh, each of, well, he'd have like uh, four, four companies and each company would have uh, four, three or four platoons. And then, uh, then you'd have the tank outfit with it. And uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, you worked closely with the tankers? Yeah, with the tanks. Okay. At times. At times. Times uh, in the jungle, you had to ride on the tank sometimes on the t to, so the, the Japs couldn't get up onto it. And they used to jump onto the tank and put a... Uh, composition for explosive on the oh. and below the tank up, see. So, Marine have to get on the back end of it and mm -hmm. ride. And now, did uh, you get uh, mail from home? Occasionally, not often. Okay. Uh, once in a while, every so often that, but you'd usually get. Uh, two or three letters at a time, and sometimes you'd get the old or uh, new one before you got the old one. You know. Did you uh, send letters home? Once in a while. About how long did it take to get home? Do you have any? Do you remember? For a letter? Yeah. I I have no idea. Okay. Sometimes it didn't take long. In a matter of uh, a week or two. A couple of weeks. Okay. But you see, when you when you make an invasion, you can't carry money in with you. Oh. And the night before the invasion, they have the dice games and the poker games. <laughs> and uh, some people end up with quite a bit of money. And I ended up with $300. And my lieutenant had a, some money. And the post office closes on the ship. And you can't carry money in with you, so some of the guys were throwing the money overboard. And he told me, he says, put your money in an envelope. And he says, I'll put mine in and address it home. He says, I'll give it to an officer on the ship here. Mm -hmm. And when the post office opens, he'll mail it. But unfortunately, it never got home. Mm -hmm. So. Did you get many replacements in your unit? Oh, yes. How are they treated? Replacements? Replacements. New oh. guys coming in. Oh, they were treated good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, like Sugarloaf Hill, uh, we lost all but three or four guys. And we had all new guys, but it uh, worked out all right. Mm -hmm. What was Sugarloaf like? Well, that uh, was, uh, it, it, it's in history. Well, for you. Went up the hill, got knocked back, and we lost uh, the biggest share of our uh, platoon. And then 
another group went up and when they got up there the Japanese had their Marines uniforms on was coming down with and they didn't know which was Marines and which was Japanese so then they got wiped out and then we went back in and we got wiped out again <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden it was over with mm -hmm. and, and we won of course but not uh, because we had so damn many men, they couldn't, they never could get to the end of you. What do you think of the Japanese soldier in general? Well, at the time I didn't think much of them. Didn't trust them, didn't want to be caught, didn't want to be a prisoner. I don't think anybody wanted to be a Japanese prisoner. Mm -hmm. They were pretty miserable to them. Did you get many Japanese prisoners? Some. And they'd take, we never keep them. Some, somebody would take them away if uh, they had guys in back of us mm -hmm. and turn them over to the army. Mm -hmm. yeah. was, your, uh, was your squad a pretty close knit group? Pretty good. Uh, in the beginning, we. Uh, we knew each other pretty well, but then in the end it got so I can't even hardly remember the names of the squad. Your own squad, 13 men, you could think of, but when you got a platoon, you had 39 men. It was pretty hard to know them all. Mm -hmm. but and the ones that I knew best, the ones that didn't get killed, have died since the war, so... The biggest share of them got Bob Kellogg and all those guys. But one guy I went over with, when, that's of interest too, when we went aboard ship at San Diego, he got seasick walking out on the dock. And he was seasick all the way over to Guadalcanal. And when he went aboard ship, he turned around and he, he says to me, he says, that's the last time I'll ever see the United States. And I said, oh, bull. And didn't he get killed the first day he got in combat? Mm -hmm. Eddie Lamberson, Chester, Pennsylvania. The, your, uh, your platoon lieutenant, pretty good guy? Well, we had so many of them. Oh, really? Yeah, they get killed in combat, and then they move them around when you was just in training. But our, uh, 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 in uh, Boots, uh, they were there all the time. Them guys stayed right there at Paris Island. Mm -hmm. But when we got in combat, they never sent any of the drill instructors over with their men. Oh. The men usually <laughs> despised them, you know. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they would have shot them if they'd have got a chance. They, they shouldn't have been, but because the guy was just training them. But... Mm -hmm. In the end, you know, you take a bunch of crap for so long and you get pretty upset. Now you got two Purple Hearts? Yeah, I, I got one Purple Heart, but I got wounded three times. Okay. But I had two Purple Hearts and I only can find one. Now, uh, that was all on Okinawa? On Okinawa and I got one on Guadalcanal too. Okay. What was the difference between fighting on Okinawa and Guadalcanal for you? Well, it was warmer at or a cooler at Okinawa, there was frost on the ground. We came, it was 120 degrees on Guadalcanal, and they uh, issued us all light clothes, and we came to Okinawa, and the next morning there was frost on the ground. You still had the light clothes? Yeah, we put them froze to death. You hear the guys with just teeth chattering, you know, holes <laughs> with you, you know. And then, uh, and then of course, it, uh, Okinawa in April, is similar to what it is here. It's cold at night, mm -hmm. and then in the daytime it'd warm up real warm, and, and then you wish you didn't have so much to, clothes to carry, you know. Did they finally get you uh, appropriate clothing? Well, we got a field jacket, okay. and then uh, of course we had a poncho and a, a blanket and a shelter half. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that was interest, I hope gets back to Washington, it's, uh, two of us had our shelter halves put together, and the Japanese came in and shot the tents full of holes 
and we applied for new ones and, and they gave us new shelter heads and took it out of our pay. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> I hope they get that. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do. I'm not no, sure they're going to reimburse you. But, uh, no, but I mean, I just thought the least they could do is stand in the shelter house, you know. <laughs> yeah. They never charge for ammunition. <laughs> you could use all you want. <laughs> well, another thing that happened to me that uh, I think about occasionally at night, we, and it was, uh, I think it was after Sugarloaf Hill, but we was online, I believe, going into Naha, and all of a sudden we were heard this. I heard this uh, shell coming, mm -hmm. and of course I was here, 15 feet or so, another guy and another guy. All of a sudden I looked up, and here comes an 88 in, and it's coming down and whistling, and I seen the nose cone on the end of it. A hex mm -hmm. brass and all of a sudden it hit right here thump 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 rolled over a few times and I went to get up and my knee legs wouldn't carry me <laughs> two guys ran out and picked me up and dragged me back it was a few minutes before and I wasn't scared really? but my legs were <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember that. Now, why that shell didn't explode, I'll never know. Interesting. You know, because uh, um, all the other ones did, you know. <laughs> My wife says it was because she was praying. <laughs> Probably was the reason. <laughs> so, I, basically on um, Guadalcanal and Okinawa? That's people? right. And I was on Saipan after in in the hospital, 148 Army Hospital. What was uh, that stay like? Well, that was... Uh, well, after I got wounded the last time, I, I was hit real bad. Okay. How'd that happen? Uh, I got hit, a machine gun got me in the rifle and turned the rifle and I hit my cartridge belt and it blew this side out here. And then my cartridge belt exploded and the spring from a, a magazine that pushes the shells up that long follower spring went into my stomach, blew in. And then, uh, this I, I probably should tell you be of, of interest. I was quite a while, the, uh, then of course the Japanese hit our platoon real hard. And I, I, I was laying there and the lieutenant gave me morphine and uh, then I don't know what happened to the platoon, but uh, I was there that night. Our platoon was surrounded. Mm -hmm. So then I stayed in the foxhole overnight with them. And the next morning, they uh, four guys put me on a stretcher and started back. And they got back towards Naha Field Hospital, like MASH. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they were carrying me, and then all of a sudden a jeep came up, and they put me crossways on the back of a jeep and headed back, and they were bouncing along, and all of a sudden they heard the awfulest scream, and it was one of those screaming rockets that they used on Jep on Okinawa, big, mm -hmm. and they screamed. They weren't so dangerous for the explosions, but they drove people wild right. listening to them, and they heard that coming, and I heard it too. I was. I managed to, I didn't pass out like I should have. And uh, so they stopped the Jeep and they threw the stretcher into a little ditch and they jumped in the ditch like that and damn it if the Jeep didn't get blew up. <laughs> and then four guys carried me a little ways further and then another Jeep came. And then when I got up to the field hospital, uh, I remember there was some kind of a tree there and there was guys laying all over on stretchers. And I remember they were take, coming out and taking them in and, and giving them the first, first aid. They didn't operate and they operated on me, but on most of them they just hold, take care of them enough to hold them. 
And I remember uh, two guys come out and looked at me and said, there's no use. That's how I knew I was pretty near gone. They said, there's no use. And I said to him, I got a wife and two kids. As true as I sat here. And he said, all of a sudden, get him in there. So then they went in and then the doctor came and he had a hip boots on, <laughs> or knee boots, mm -hmm. and he had a bottle of whiskey in his <laughs> I could see that. And he says to me, he says, 50 years from now, he says, this will all be a dream. Mm -hmm. And he's right, too. And uh, that, then I conked out. When I come to, it was morning. I think it was morning, and it was later anyway, and I was laying on, a, on the floor on something, and there was guys laying all around. Harry Householder, I heard this voice, and I says, Householder, and he says, yes. He was our, com our platoon ru our company runner. Mm -hmm. And I says, what happened? He says, our platoon is wiped right out, he says. We're all, and he named off different ones, Carlson and different ones. And he was talking right along with me. And all of a sudden, I turned around and looked, and they pulled a poncho over him. Mm -hmm. He was dead. Well, then, pretty soon, I looked up, and here comes Sergeant Bill Bryce, and I sure would like to find him. He's from... Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he had been shot in the head, but he was walking, big fella. Uh, uh, he was a master sergeant, and he uh, stopped, and he says, how are you doing, Ledoux? And I says, better. He says, I'll make you some soup. So he took one of them little Munson burners, mm -hmm put a canteen cup onto it and put some water in, put a soup pill into it and set it afire. <laughs> Pretty soon I looked up and he put his rifle on his shoulder and he walked out and of course that naturally that's the last time I've ever seen him. Mm. But he made me, and then I couldn't eat it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna finish the story to get to Saipan. Excuse me just a second, let's, we've got a change. He'd say, what did, would Jack do in a case like this <laughs> when you get in trouble? You know, I'd say, what would Jack Willard do? And then you'd tell him, he'd say, well, then do it. <laughs> but We're gone. when uh, uh, I was in this f field hospital, it was at Naha, mm -hmm. and there was a wall around it, but there was snipers shooting against the wall all the time. And then... They took me from there, they took me out and put me on a open boat, laying in the bottom of an open boat, because the spray come in, the salt came in and got into these, where I had been opened up and took all that junk out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was pretty miserable. And then a sailor came to me and he says to me, he says, he took his canteen, he says, you want a drink of water? And I said, I can't have a drink of water. I said, I'm gut shot. I says, it'll turn to poison. He says, well, he says, if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. See, those are the things I remember. Mm -hmm. So they took me out, and finally they went up to a ship, and they dropped the net down, took me up and put me on deck, and then the, the ship doctor came and said that they couldn't handle me. They could only take lesser mm -hmm. wounds. So back again, and then I had to go cross cable to another ship. I ended up on what I always said was the relief hospital ship. And it may be on the, my discharge papers, the relief hospital ship. But I've talked with people over there, and they said that it wasn't a relief hospital ship. But I... I always thought it was. Mm -hmm. And then when I got on the ship, I, uh, of course, I had infection so bad that uh, my side blew out and it went all over the place. And they uh, finally, there were so many thousand on that ship, as far as you could see, there was eight, nine high. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, 
after I complained enough, and then after my side blew out and all that infection blew out and got all over the ones underneath me and everything, they came and rolled me out of the bunk onto a stretcher and then they turned the mattress over, or the pad, and put some disinfectant onto it and then put me back into the bed and I laid there a few minutes and I began to burn. Mm. So then I, I, you know, you hate to complain because there's so many guys sure. worse off than you are. But I kept squirming around and, and complaining to them until they came and come to find out I was blistered uh, my back. Well, oh, incidentally too, uh, the first night uh, was on the first afternoon or night, whatever it was, I was on the hospital ship. A suicide plane hit the hospital ship. Oh dear. Hit and knocked the bow off of it because we was laying there and all of a sudden they came and put wet towels over our faces and uh, didn't r damage the ship enough so they couldn't use it, but it took quite a blow on the bow. Hmm. Suicide plane. Well then, I don't know how many days it was or anything, I have no way to go to Saipan. Mm -hmm. When I got to Saipan, I was in a Army, 148 Army Hospital. And uh, I had Jean Fields for a nurse, and she was from Salamanca, New York. Can you believe it, you know? And, and she was with me all the time. Say there, she'd go and sleep, but if I moved around much, she'd be back. And for a long time, uh, I had full-time care because I, I believe me, I pretty near died. Mm. I was paralyzed, and uh, then I don't know how long I was on Saipan. I had quite a few problems there, and. Uh, then I went to uh, Pearl Harbor, I .e. Heights Hospital. And on the way from Saipan to Pearl Harbor, was on a C-47, and they lost them. one motor conked out and they had to land on Wake mm -hmm. and uh, change planes. <laughs> and I got to Pearl Harbor, and then uh, they uh, was pretty pretty good at, at IU Heights Hospital, but then uh, I don't know when that was, but I was there when the war ended oh. at Pearl Harbor because they had a juice cart come through the hospital uh, uh, two times a day in the middle of the afternoon and mm -hmm. maybe in the evening, and they they dumped whiskey into the juice cart. And it was drunken sailors, drunken marines, <laughs> drunken doctors, drunken nurses. <laughs> they had a hell of a time when the war ended, you know. They tell me that they had the same thing back here in the streets. You know, everybody went wild. Well then, I'll, make, I'll shorten this up. Then I left, uh, I was at Pearl Harbor for quite a long time. And then I came to Oakland, California in the hospital. And I was in the hospital there for, well, in August I was in Pearl Harbor, and I was in Oakland, and I was back at si Samson Navy Base mm -hmm. in the hospital by November. How long it took in between, I don't know. But uh, then I was at Samson Navy Base from November till May of 46. Mm. Samson went out of business soon after that. Soon after. As a naval base. Uh, yeah, Samson was soon after that. The hospital closed long about the same time, too. Okay. But uh, 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 I don't know how soon the Air Force took it over. Well, actually, between the two, it was a temporary college for the guys coming back. Was the there? Day, because I was there. I lost track of the, everything then. And after, uh, uh, in May, I got, finally got discharged. They operated and took the last bullets out. You must have had a stomach full of lead. Oh, I got a mess there. I 
been a mess ever since. But uh, but that uh, I don't know of too much I can tell you. In the combat, there was a lot of things happened, but there's so many that. What sticks out in your mind? Oh, uh, shooting at kids. We're sitting in a foxhole eating beans out of a can. I'm with a Tennessee boy sitting in there and of course the orders in the morning was to shoot everybody that you've seen. And all of a sudden I looked up and I saw this old man and two little kids run across. And I went on eating my beans, you know. And all of a sudden this guy that was with me, he looked over and he picked up his rifle and and, you know, that was not necessary either, I don't think, see? Mm -hmm. I remember, I, I think about that a lot of times. Because mm -hmm. I guess you, uh, war is bad, but I don't think you have to be as bad as some of them were, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, these Japanese prisoners, I came home with one that had been skinned. They took strips of skin off of him. He was crazier than a bat. He'd be laying there, and all of a sudden he'd scream, you know. And oh, I have another one that was in Pearl Harbor with me, and, and he was out of his head too, I guess, because he thought he was a weightlifter. He said all, all the time he was picking up weights, and <laughs> lifting them. He didn't have anything, but <laughs> uh, that's that's enough. So how do you um, how do you view your experience in general? Any way of summing it up? Well, I don't know. I I wouldn't part with it, but I wouldn't want it again. You know. But um, uh, you get pretty good care until we got to Samson. In Samson, the war ended, of course, in August. Mm -hmm. And here's five, six months later, the doctors wanted to go home. So you'd ask the doctor, can't you hurry up and get me patched up? Well, this week I'm going pheasant hunting. Next week I'm going to do this. and Maybe I can get to you in a couple, three weeks, you know. And then they'd be discharged and another doctor would come in. But the doctors wanted to go home too. Mm -hmm. And finally... This I think you should know too. I, I finally I stood up for roll call and I had a cigarette in my hand. I didn't stand up. I sat on the edge of the bed and the doctor came and he was a captain. And he says, you stand up there. And I says, he says, you realize I'm a captain in the Navy uh, doctors? And I says, I, I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and I want to know when the hell I'm going to be operated on. And he, he suspended me to the, my bed and told me that I couldn't leave the hospital, and uh, I was in deep trouble. So then I, after he left, I got up and walked out and went to Commodore Bat's office, the Commodore. Mm -hmm. And the boy at the door wouldn't let me in, so I went over and stood to one side, and when the boy walked away, I walked in and went right over and talked with Commodore Batts. If he was around, he'd probably remember that, because he was quite upset. And then he says, I can understand the way you feel. And he, he wrote a note on a paper, he says, take this to the M.A. shack and turn it in and get a pass and go home for a couple, three days. He says, and come back. And I did that and when I come back, they had all new doctors. And within a week I was operated on and two or three weeks I was home. Oh, that's good. See? You were discharged at that point? Well, later, yeah, to Bainbridge, Maryland. I had to go to Bain, I had to go to New York Navy uh, yard, uh, New York, Na Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I was down there for a couple, three days, and then I went to Bainbridge, Maryland, and was discharged at Bainbridge. Mm -hmm. 
And there was an interesting thing too. I was walking across the, the parade field with uh, a couple of other sailors or Marines, I forget which, and all of a sudden I looked up and I saw Colonel Beans. And I run over and I said, hey, Beans. <laughs> and he had sat in the foxhole with me overseas and ate out of the same can. You straighten up there and don't you ever do that to me again here. You know, you just don't do that. <laughs> of course, where I was, nobody paid any attention to re regulations. Mm -hmm. See, I, the stripes didn't mean anything and bars uh, after when we was in overseas. Mm -hmm. That's just when you're in bases and like that. Right. But after, but I, I got quite a kick out of that too because he was upset, but I disliked him for it afterwards. I thought he could have <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> remembered when we was all for one. So once you got discharged, you got home. I got home, and I wasn't supposed to go to work. In fact, I was never to work again. And uh, I was home for short time and finally I decided to make my blacksmith shop. Okay. So I cut my garage in two and widened it out and built a forge in the back and uh, started doing some work and mm -hmm. puttering along and all of a sudden I was went on working and I, I worked ever since. Were you able to get uh, disability? Oh yeah. I, I was 100% for uh, about, in 1947, I put a new furnace in, I bought a new car. I was doing good. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, war guy come home, everybody was hiring me to do things. Mm -hmm. Bank was lenient with me and I, I bought a new car and I put a new furnace in and then I got a letter from the uh, veterans that I had to report to uh, the city here and I went in and they said we had a complaint from one of your neighbors that you're a hundred percent disabled and that you're still working and making money nice neighbors. yeah so uh, they told me who it was too it was a minister's wife and uh, so then I talked with him, and it was an English doctor that I had. And he told me, he says, you could be president of the United States and you're still entitled to your disability. You know, mm -hmm. and, but I was disabled as a blacksmith, see, mm -hmm. and that hard, hard work. But uh, anyway, I, I told them, I said, if you cut it to 90%, will there be any? And they says, they cut it to 90%. And it's been that ever since. Hmm. So, but uh, I suppose it isn't right, you know. Uh, uh, you're on disability. Now, I just got a... Uh, a letter the other day that said that I never knew it that if you uh, had a hundred percent or uh, had disability from combat mm -hmm. war whatever you want to call it you couldn't have a uh, disability from Social Security or anything else mm -hmm. and I suppose that's right same as you can't have two fire insurances pay for the same fire <laughs> <See>? <laughs> So um, what did you think of your experience as a Marine? Well, I, th I thought it was great. I think a lot of the Marine Corps, and if, if, uh, I think it's the best outfit there is. Well, we'd like to thank you very much. That's Appreciate enough. you coming in. I hope I didn't bore you. Not at all. I've never been bored. I. Uh, a lot of times you're sitting there and you think of a lot of stories. I tell them a lot of stories, but uh, sometimes I think they get sick of hearing them. <laughs> Do you have some pictures you want to show us? We can get them on, on tape.
language. He brought two Japanese flags. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> They're pretty beat up. Of them I took off. Oh, That's I, okay. I took off of uh, a Japanese that was killed. I can't see him. I mean, uh, this this one a good one? Oh no, that one. He got riddled. Well, that's all right. Well, that's, that's part of the story. But my wife, uh, this one here wasn't too bad. Now I'll tell you an interesting story about these. Okay. When I was on Saipan, they had Japanese girls in the hospital working, mm -hmm. and they found these, and they had these out laid out on the bed, and they was. Looking at because that's the names of the guys that's in this man's platoon. Oh, oh I see. See? Okay. You've probably seen plates like that. Before. Yeah, we've seen a few. Those are great. Uh, that's, uh, I give them to my grandson, so. This was taken at Samson. I don't know who's laying with you, Dad. Might be Berger. If you can hold that up, I can, yeah. I can zero in on it. Uh, that is, is uh, Ketter and there's oh. three of us? Or? No, there's just two. the two of you. Ketter. Okay. He was on, he was wounded on Ewo. Now which one is you? He's in the to the I think I was on the right hand bed. Oh, I was, on the right. Right. I was in the left hand bed. Yeah, okay. But you're to the right. This is a Samson? Yeah, yeah, we had a private room. Got it. Three of us uh, had a private room, uh, Satterly and Ketter and I. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah. These are, this, you took these off a Japanese soldier after you killed well, him. Well, uh... That's his family. Yeah. You found those pictures on him. This was Saipan, Okinawa? Okinawa. And okay. These are just pictures of villagers. I don't know if it's Okinawa or where. Uh. I can't tell you. I I'm, I'm I know they're villagers. I just don't know where it was taken. Um, Probably is. Uh, they, uh, if they're civilized people, it's not Guadalcanal. You know what I mean? Right. Hold, hold them up. Is this right side up? Yep. Okay. Let me get the one on top. Okay. Okay. And this is Yen's and Sen's. No, that's no, pictures. No, that's those are pictures. Oh. Two Japanese. This is your. You brought oh, your purple, purple heart. heart. Yeah, yeah. But they've seen hundreds. And of you have. And dime a dozen. He's no. got pictures uh, of. Um, my, I had one that was. You've so, got pictures so of Samson. I think was, in your unit. Huh? You got pictures of. Let's see. She's got quite a. I was at Samson in 1947. This is um. This is the day you were discharged. At the, at the Navy base. Right after it was a Navy base, it became a temporary college. My dad was an instructor there. Oh, so I I've got pictures of me at Samson. Okay. Have, have you have, you know where the hospital area was? Yeah. Uh, uh, it was south of. Uh, Callahan unit and okay. and them places. This is your Paris Island unit platoon. Oh, you got pictures of that. That might be they could get and that. And those are the pictures you carried on you yeah. of mom and my brothers. That uh, that's the platoon. Whereabouts are you in there? Do you no. know? In the middle. <laughs> I I know where. You Down are. in here somewhere. <laughs> right above my thumb. <laughs> okay. And that's the pictures he carried on him of my mother. You were born just after the war? I came after the war. My brothers were pre-war. <laughs> okay. So you're the kid? Yeah. Okay. And then there's some pictures. There's a picture of Jeannie Fields, the nurse that you were... Oh, neat. Oh, so, good. Uh, um, you I've tried, I've tried to no, find her. No, we've tried to find her, and we haven't oh, had any I'm, luck. But I'm, that was his nurse in Saipan. Was she in the military? Was she, yes. she was an army nurse. nurse. She was an army nurse. Through the uh, Freedom of Information Act, uh, you could request her records. Really? Yeah. If you uh, have, he would have love her. to I, find I tried. We went to Salamanca. My wife and I would go to Salamanca every so often and drive mm -hmm. around and... I never found. Uh, We've been trying to find her, but uh, another thing, 
another nurse that was down in Saipan, a blonde girl. When I come to, I thought she was an angel, you know this? <laughs> I, did. I woke up and here this uh, real clean, white, mm -hmm. blonde hair bending over, and I, I really thought, well, this is That's great. Angel Graber, or whatever you want to say. <laughs> Eddie Lamberton, he died, didn't Eddie he? Eddie Lamberton, you got that a That was the picture that was taken the day before he got killed, I believe. Yeah. That you told us. Okay. Make a 